Greetings and welcome to Political Viewpoint. I'm your host Eric and today before we get started just want to let you know that this is the start of the series that will be giving you the basic qualifications and knowledge um, as mentioned in our previous video on antiquated ideas and channel update video. If you haven't seen that I suggest you go quickly watch that before uh, getting started on this one. So today's topic is going to be covering the core principles of state behavior, which then leads into the four other main theories that govern the field of political science and govern politics internationally. So understanding these core principles will then allow you to understand from where those theories um, are derived from because they're trying to tackle these core principles, these core issues um, that are inherent in the world uh, and inherent to politics and uh, the formation of societies. So a little bit deep, I know, but we're going to be as um, quick and efficient as possible uh, for you guys here today. So without further ado, let's address some of the core principles of state behavior in political science. In particular, the theories that come out of international relations that inform the rest of the field revolve around solving one key problem. That is, on the international level, how does a group such as two or more nations, and then if you go down to the national level, two or more provinces or states, keep going down, two or more cities, keep going down, two or more suburbs within a city, all the way down to the personal level, how do two or more people serve their collective interests when doing so requires the group members to forego their individual interests? An example of this, especially in politics currently, is the problem of global warming. It's an issue that requires collaboration, and it is in the collective interest of the group to address it, and for us as a species to get better at it and addressing it. However, it requires us to put our own egos and perhaps our own individual and state interests, personal interests, aside to look at the bigger picture and come together to work on the bigger picture. This is what's considered in political science a collective goods problem. And a collective goods problem is the problem of how to provide something that benefits all members of a group, regardless of what each member contributes to it individually. So essentially not counting the costs. Going further. So in general, collective goods, they're easier to provide in small groups rather than large ones, right? In a small group, say four people, defection, which is more commonly um, referred to as free riding, it's a lot easier to punish because it's harder to conceal. If one guy is not pulling his weight or doing anything out of four people, it's pretty obvious who's not doing anything, right? As a result, it has a greater impact on the overall collective good of the group. If Jimmy's not building roofs for the shelters while everybody else is doing a task that are associated to building the shelter, it's going to be pretty obvious when it starts to rain, hey, we don't have a roof. Jimmy, that was your one job. And thus, it's actually easier to punish somebody for free riding in a small group as well. Because then you can sit down with Jimmy, have a real man-to-man -man conversation with him, or perhaps get rid of Jimmy and go look for his brother Johnny that is a professional roof builder. That sort of mentality. A uh, good example of this, uh, kind of how that's addressed and stuff, could be in, you know, the colloquial TV show Survivor, right? When somebody gets voted off the island, kind of the tribe has spoken mentality um, when it gets down to the last few people in there, or even from the start, if you will. However, these collective goods problems, they occur in all groups and at all level of society, especially... You know, and that's the real issue that um, 
where where it gets more of a, a larger issue and lar the larger the group it that it is so that's why these collective good issues are particularly acute in international affairs so there's no central authority such as a world government to enforce on individual nations the necessary measures to provide for the common good. Now I know some of you might think immediately, well what about the UN? Now regardless on your political viewpoints on whether or not the UN is effective or not effective or things of that nature, there is the simple fact that the way that the UN works is nations individually come together to talk about and propose ideas and um, uh, to try and solve coll these collective goods issues and it's upon the responsibility of each individual nation to partake and to take either take action or to not take action on these ideas that they've come up with um, so it's on them to action it and to enforce there is no UN body or group, and there certainly isn't the UN army that would enforce these policies and these ideas to take place. It is on the responsibility of every single individual. Now, I know you might be thinking, well, what about there's an army, the UN peacekeepers? Completely different role, and what they're doing is not enforcement. If anything, you can say maybe they're enforcing uh, certain, uh, certain guidelines um, to keep peace and again different viewpoints on that there are many there's lots of arguments a lot big can of worms don't want to open that right now but just to keep it simple there's you know for this there's no central authority uh, to enforce individual nations uh, to take up the necessary measures to provide for the common good so how is the free rider issue addressed at this huge international level, right? Going from what I was talking about before with Jimmy and the four other guys. So, moving on. There's three basic principles that have come up that try to offer possible solutions for this core problem of getting actors to cooperate for the common good without a central authority to make them do so. And these three principles are dominance, reciprocity, and identity. So let's delve into them and expand a little more. So dominance. So dominance is an approach that tries to solve the collective goods problem by establishing a, pi a power hierarchy in which those at the top control those below. Think of it as a status hierarchy. There's symbolic acts of submission by the weaker ones and dominance by the more dominant ones that reinforce this hierarchy. Um, you can think of it as a, as a hegemon or a superpower, right? The ones on top are responsible for giving resources and favors to the weaker ones below and vice versa, the ones that are at the bottom likewise need to show the respect, the reverence, and perhaps resources towards the more dominant one as well. Uh, the advantage of the dominant solution is that it forces members of a group to contribute to the common good through this authority, through uh, military, not all the time, but it's always typically there, that aspect of force and because that has a lot to do with the theory of legitimacy and sovereignty. That's a discussion for another time, but just know this for now. Um, and the other argument uh, for the advantage of this solution is that it minimizes open conflict within the group because that would put you in bad standing and with the rest of the group, especially if you're lower on the totem pole. Um, you're going to have the more dominant, powerful uh, ones at the top come down on you pretty hard, and vice versa. If you're at the top and you're starting to do things that would anger, you know, the co all the smaller collective, they're still a collective, and if they can band together, and immediately you can be from going on top to being ostracized or put down by the by the collective rest of them. So this kind of puts the conflict behind closed doors and in between the sheets, as they say. Some disadvantages uh, of this dominant solution is that the stability 
that it brings, it comes at a cost of constant oppression and uh, constant oppression of and resentment by the lower ranking members in this status hierarchy, right? It's all great and fine uh, dining and whining at the top of this power hierarchy, but of course, yeah, who wants to be the lowest man on the totem pole in this uh, hegemon, in this, in this totem pole? Conflicts, and this is other one, so conflicts over position then sometimes will harm the group's stability and well-being, right? For example... Um, somebody being on the last two rungs in this totem pole, they band together. They, this is where all the political scheming and kind of the um, aspects of revolution, independence, all this sort of thing start coming out of the woodwork here. And yeah, it definitely would hurt the group stability and the overall well-being because it's getting away from what the what it was trying to solve in the first place, which was that collective goods problem right so all of a sudden we're not focused on the problems that we all came together to solve and we're focusing on other things mainly realistically our egos in this hierarchy okay moving on to the second one reciprocity so reciprocity seeks to solve the collective goods problem by rewarding behavior that contributes to the group and punishing behavior that pursues self-interest at the cost of the group. So kind of rewarding good behavior, punishing bad behavior, if we keep it simple, right? Um, it's easy to understand and can be enforced without actual central authority. So less of a military aspect and like power dynamic there. If, and I, that's a strong if, if it's strict and there's articulated guidelines that m make it easy to understand and make it easy to follow um, kind of the steps of how do we, you know, how to solve the collective goods problem, act this way, do this, do that, make it really easy to follow. And thus, if somebody steps out of line, it's then easy to jump in and enforce the rules and, and deal with it that way. If, but that requires, again, hard if, it requires a strict and articulated guidelines that everybody agrees upon. Now you can kind of see where we're going to lead into the disadvantages of this approach. So this can lead sometimes into a downward, a downward spiral as each side punishes what it believes to be the negative acts of the other individual in the group. So, you know, if you think of it in layman's terms, like generally people tend to overestimate their own good intentions and underestimate those of their opponents or rivals, you know? Um, and it's just the subjectivity comes into play so hard here because it requires everybody in, in the group to have a similar viewpoints and uh, perceptions of the world and morals and all that sort of thing. So, you know, um, that's the bigger question that kind of pops up, you know, is the subjectivity and especially if there's not very strict and articulated guidelines, then people start uh, finding every which way to kind of question like, no, you think I was doing like this was bad behavior, like technically no, this was legal and all that sort of thing. And kind of it just degenerates into kind of an eye for an eye reciprocity um, rather than <laughs> kind of what it was intended uh, to do in the first place. And then the last one, identity. So members of an identity community, how they try to solve the collective goods issue is by caring about the interests of others in their community enough to sacrifice their own interests to benefit others. So plain Jane down to one world word, altruism, empathy, okay? Using that identity that's either just built within the, f the nuclear family, like whether it be extended family, kinship groups, like going into archaeological or anthropo anthropological theory, um, you know, race, sex, all this, all these things, everything you can, you can imagine and that's talked about in terms of identity, it's there. And that, you know, essentially that group. Uh, if you identify that you identify with, you're willing to do stuff for them for the sake be of them just being p 
part of that group, part of that identity. So the disadvantage for this is that it can lead to the demonizing of other, quote, outgroups, uh, and it can create elitism and cliques, right? Because, you know, it's great to be part of the club when you ident like, you know, if you're accepted into the identity group and you're part of that identity, you know, you feel safe, you feel at home, uh, it's a tight bond, but anybody who doesn't fit in to that identity, you know, is left out, left out of the, cl and left out of the, the collective goods, uh, equation. And this is where we start seeing, like I said, cliques and, and elitism and, and, and just, you know, uh, smaller fragmented social groups, uh, being formed. So this is a this is a bigger question that comes out of this that's covered in psychology, covered in political theory, covered in philosophy as well, and sociology. It's I mean you can type this into Google and you'll get this, okay? It's the big question of the self versus the other. I don't even want to try and get down this rabbit hole with you guys here today because it's supposed to be basic, straightforward to help you guys uh, get get into the rest of the material that's going to be discussed here. So, um, but needless to say, uh, you can uh, search that up on your own if you're intrigued by this question. It's a very good one to sit down to with quite a few cups of coffee. <laughs> So, just a quick, easy reference table for all that I just uh, kind of explained a little bit more in, in, in depth, right? These are the core principles for trying to solve collective goods problems, right? First principle, dominance, right? Top down, bottom up kind of approaches and directions of, uh, of movement within policy there, right? The advantages right? There's order, there's stability, there's predictability because of that pi power hierarchy. You know that in this small group of nations that the one on top, he's setting the agenda, the ones on the bottom, they're making it work. And the ones on the bottom are bringing issues that are happening on the ground up the chain to the bigger ones that can then brainstorm and you see how it goes from there. Again, remember the drawbacks, the oppression, the resentment, the power politics, all the, the cloak and dagger stuff that can come with that. The egos, right? Reciprocity, it's more of a lateral movement in policy um, because, again, you're rewarding and punishing behavior and you're trying to do that um, objectively based on criteria. So there's not a lot of, you know, it. In theory, it's supposed to not have a lot of that kind of uh, power politics that is involved in the dominance way of things. And again, advantages. So it's supposed to in incentivize uh, the individuals to mutually cooperate because they're going to get rewarded if they do the thing that's in the, the interest of solving the collective good, right? There's an actual, there's a cake for them after doing that thing. And again, as I described, the downward spirals are the drawbacks, the complex accounting in terms of, that's something I didn't quickly mention there, but, you know, accounting for all the actions uh, of states, known and unknown, is, it's very hard because it requires transparency. And that is a huge issue and topic in politics um, since kingdom come and still currently today. So you can imagine. And then identity, right? Outward in, absolutely. Um, that's how the policies are derived. You know, you're taking the world around you and you're bringing people together into something, which is the identity. So the advantages is everybody is sacrificing for the sake of the group, right? You're able to redefine what those interests are of the group at any given time because it's a smaller group, t generally speaking, in terms of when it comes to that identity. Um, and that's how you can start to, you know, if you look at some of the social movements um, throughout history, that generally speaking, when you compare it to political or, or 
uh, political movements or movements of thought, like in the Enlightenment or whatnot, that took hundreds of years. Uh, whereas with social movements, they generally speaking, they happen a lot shorter and a lot quicker. And they can be um, mobilized a lot faster because identity, right? And how, it, how that system works. Again, the drawbacks, like I said, demonizing the outgroup, racial conflict, like let... Like, you guys can, I think, intuitively fill in the blanks there uh, for the long list of drawbacks that comes from my identity. As, as good of things that you can draw out of it, the drawbacks are equally uh, as dark and um, as negative. So uh, that's going to conclude this uh, lecture, kind of the, the first basic one uh, that's just covering the core principles of state behavior. Um, the next videos are going to be on respectively realism and neorealism, liberalism, neoliberalism, li neo the neo neo debate, and you'll understand that when we come when when we come to it, functionalism, uh, and then I'm going to fit in kind of the other shotgun uh, theories that try and tackle these core principles of state behavior that aren't full-on ideologies so that's where kind of like you know marxism capitalism socialism those are ideologies and they are different than what we're talking about here um so we're gonna get into we need to get into realism uh and liberalism and functionalism because those are things that the general public actually for the most part don't understand or don't know about and these are the things these are the schools of thoughts that our policymakers, our statesmen, um, actually follow and um, conduct their policy making and their politics uh, under. It's what governs them uh, far more than ideologies. Ideologies is kind of the blanket and on the background. Um, this is the meat and potatoes. So Thank you guys for tuning in and watching. As always, you can check out our Medium page for a full-on written version of this uh, video lecture, as well as please check out our Patreon page if you wish to find a way to support us and our work and keep us growing in the right direction, um, or if you're just interested in checking that out and getting alerts as to when new content is posted from us. And uh, we'll see you next time here on Political Viewpoint. Thank you.